the driving social justice issue of your generation is pro-life. And that's why it's a privilege for me to introduce our next guest, Stephanie Gray. I've been hearing about Stephanie Gray, I think, for 16 years. And if you want to know how to most effectively share the pro-life message, this is the woman to talk to. She is from Canada. There are some more Canadians here. I live in Hawaii, and this time of year, half of my state is from Canada. So let's give a pro-life generation welcome to Stephanie Gray, pro-life leader, pro-life hero. Thank you very much. It is always wonderful to come to the United States of America. Now, I wanted to begin uh, not talking about your country or mine, but someone who was living in England many decades ago. And in 1938, this man was a very successful stockbroker in England, and he was going to take a lovely ski vacation in December of 1938. And just before he was go going to go on his vacation, a friend of his called, and this friend was essentially doing missionary work, you could say. He was helping people in Czechoslovakia who were forced to live under horrible conditions just prior to the start of the Second World War. And he called this man by the name of Nicholas Winton, his friend, and he said, will you come to Prague and will you help me? So Nicholas Winton abandoned his plans to go on his vacation, and instead he went over to Prague. And he saw these horrible conditions, as I say, that the people were forced to live under. And what he observed when he was there was that there was an effort being made to help adults escape. But nothing was being done to help children escape. Nicholas Winton saw a need, and he responded to that need. He then went back to England, and he got permission from the government in England as well as Sweden for them to allow families within their countries to welcome children into their homes to keep them safe during the war. And so in the months preceding World War II, from March of 1939 until August of 1939, eight trainloads of children were taken from Czechoslovakia to the safety of families in Sweden and England. Nicholas Winton once said, there is a difference between passive goodness and active goodness. There is a difference between passive goodness and active goodness. The latter is, in my opinion, the giving of one's time and energy for the alleviation of pain and suffering. Nicholas Winton saw a need, and he responded to that need with active goodness. And as a result... 669 children were spared murder from the Second World War. Their lives were preserved because Nicholas Winton had active goodness. As I have reflected on all that he did, it occurred to me that what makes his efforts different from our efforts is that he could simply take the children out of the dangerous situation that they were in. We can't remove preborn children whose lives are threatened by abortion. We cannot take them out of the womb. And so as much as we are called to the kind of act of goodness that Nicholas Winton lived out, we can't do it in the same way. We must use instead our powers of persuasion. We must compel the woman in crisis and everyone around her who has the power to influence her, we must compel them to defend life, to look at the preborn child and recognize that child is unrepeatable and irreplaceable and worthy of respect and protection. And so this morning what I want to do is help equip you to be able to use the powers of persuasion to convince people to protect preborn children from abortion. In order to do that, I'm going to explain what I consider to be a new approach 
for how to dialogue with people. And it's an approach that I employed in a conversation I had with a teenager just a couple years ago. A teenager and I were debating about abortion outside his high school. And he was quite animated and passionate. He was cutting me off. He was talking really loud. He was very angry. And at one point in his anger, he looked at me and he goes, well, what if you have a 12-year-old girl raped by her father, pregnant with a deformed fetus, and she's going to die? And I stood there thinking, wow, okay, just take one of these scenarios, and that's a difficult situation to deal with. But he just had to take all the hard cases and lump them into one. And because he had been cutting me off, I thought, how am I going to adequately respond to each one of these points so that he actually listens and receives. And then a thought came to my mind. And the thought that came to my mind was to ask myself a question. What did this student really say to me? If we listen closely enough to the people who are in front of us, what we will discover is we will hear things they don't even say. What was behind his words? What was he really saying but not verbalizing? Because if I could figure that out, and if I could respond to that, then maybe I can win him over. And so in a very quick passage of time, I, I quickly thought to myself, what he actually said to me is, what if you have a 12-year-old girl, and her circumstances are hard, they're hard, they're really, really hard. And the moment I translated what he'd said to that, I thought to myself, well, this is going to be difficult because I can't make the pro-life view easy. I can make it easier to carry through with the unplanned pregnancy, with support and journeying with a woman through that crisis. I can make it easier, but I can't make it easy. And this guy's thinking, look, if her circumstances are really, really hard, she needs an abortion. How do I respond? So my first response was to at least affirm that I'd heard what he'd actually verbalized. I said, you know, there's a lot there and those are fair questions. Because for the people who are in those circumstances, those are very real crises and they deserve a response. And I promise you, I'm going to respond to each one of those. If you'll bear with me, I said to him, part of answering your question is to ask you one. And then I explained even further before I got to my question. I said, and the question I'm going to ask you might seem off topic. But I promise you, if you'll bear with me, the question is very relevant to the questions you just asked me. And so at that point, he went quiet because he's intrigued by this mysterious, you know, discussion that I've just, all these points that I've mysteriously made. And so then he's quiet. I look at him and I say, is there anyone who inspires you? And the guy who was cutting me off and quite angry went quiet. But he was quiet for so long, I thought, oh my goodness, what if this guy lacks inspiration? So I started to give him examples. And I said, you know, like, you know, someone you know in your family, or maybe someone you've never met but has lived in the history of the world and you've just heard about them. I said, or maybe the person who inspires you isn't a real person. Is there someone in a book you've read or a movie you've watched who's a mere character, but they have had a positive influence on how you feel and how you think and even how you behave? Is there anyone who inspires you? He said, yes, there is. And I said, excellent, who is it? And he, he said some name, and I had no clue who this person was. But I didn't need to know. All I needed to know was the prayer of St. Francis, which in the middle of the prayer says, O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be understood as to understand. So I just had to know I need to seek to understand this guy and everything he knows that I don't know. So I said, I don't know who this person is. Would you tell me about him? And so he began to describe this guy. He was a boxer, and he was from a family of boxers, and he'd gone through a lot of turmoil in his, his, in his life. A couple of his relatives had committed suicide. So this student continued to describe this guy, and I continued to ask questions in order to seek to understand what was it about this boxer that this teenager found so inspiring. And so as I was asking questions and drawing more out and learning about the suffering he faced in his family, I asked, you know, did, did he give up on his life or is, is he turning his obstacle into an opportunity? He said, no, you know, he's, he's great at what he does and he's got a beautiful family himself and he's not despairing when times are tough and he overcomes obstacles. And he was telling me all this stuff and then as I was drawing more and more out of him, what I ended drawing out of him 
is what I have drawn out of people all over the world who I've asked that very same question. Who inspires you? And what I've discovered is that I get different answers for who. But there is a common theme for why the people who inspire us inspire us. And I've discovered that what sets apart those who inspire from those who do not is not that the inspiring person has led an easy life. It's typical that the person who inspires has led a life of suffering, but what sets them apart from all the others is how they respond to the suffering they face. They put others before themselves. They have perspective. In the face of an obstacle, their perspective change says, I can look for an opportunity. And finally, I have discovered that people who inspire us tend to do the right thing even when it's hard. Once I had drawn all of these truths out of him through seeking to understand, through asking questions, once I had identified that this particular student was inspired by someone who put others first, had perspective, and did the right thing even when it was hard, I took those core beliefs from him, views he already held dear, and I showed how the views he already held dear very much apply to the situations he just asked about. The 12-year-old girl raped by her father, pregnant with a deformed fetus, and she's going to die. I asked him to consider if he was inspired by the boxer who put others first, had perspective, and did the right thing even when it was hard, then shouldn't we do the same thing in moments of crisis like that which the young girl may face? Put others first, have perspective, and do the right thing even when it's hard. And so what I want to do in the time we have together this morning is expand on each one of those points to show how if we can use questions which enable us to understand and stories which make ideas and principles more clear and comprehensible, to elaborate on these three points, then I think we can defend the pro-life view well and I think we can win people to the pro-life perspective. So let's take that first quality, that of putting others before ourselves. If I were to ask you, thinking about our present day culture, if you think the culture is generally selfless or selfish, which would you say? Selfish, unfortunately, it seems that way. With a lot of our rhetoric, with a lot of the choices we make, it seems like we're in a very selfish culture. Yet I believe deep down in our heart of hearts, we know that that is not the way to live. We know that the ideal is that we are more focused on others than ourselves. A few years ago, I was debating with a university student about abortion. And as we were bantering back and forth, it was becoming very clear to me that his rhetoric was very, very selfish. And it was so shockingly selfish, I was tempted to just look at him and say, you know, you sound really selfish. But if I had said that, he probably would have done one of two things. The first option would have been to say, no, I'm not. At which point I could have said, yes, you are. And he would have said, no, I'm not. And I would have said, yes, you are. And that wouldn't have been very fruitful in the conversation. The other option that he, he might have responded with was to say, yeah, so. And then I would have been like, oh boy, what do I do now? So instead, I thought to myself that what is written on his heart is written on my heart. And it's a truth that will set us free. And what is written on our hearts is a desire for the true, the good, and the beautiful. And that means putting others before ourself because that is true and that is good and that is beautiful. I don't need to convince this guy to be selfless. I need to ask him questions and tell stories to draw out of him that he already holds that view. And it just so happened that there had been a news story recently occurring at the time he and I were discussing that I drew on to make the point that deep down he knew we should be selfless. When he made one of his comments, I said, you know what you just said is very interesting. It reminds me of a story I heard about in the news recently. You probably heard about it yourself. There was this captain of a cruise ship that had been steering his ship a little too close to an Italian village. And he grounded his ship and it started to sink. And people, some people lost their lives. Do you remember the story I asked him? 
How many of you remember that story? A good number of you. And unfortunately, that, well, I'll tell you what he did, and then we'll see how that has repeated itself in even more recent news. But I said to the student who remembered it, I said, this made international news, not just because of the accident, not just because people lost their lives, but why, I asked him a question, why did that particular story rock the world, draw the world's attention? What element of the story shocked people? Who remembers? What's it? Because the captain of the ship abandoned the ship before everyone got off. And the students said this, and I said, and our world looked at that and said that was right or wrong. What do you think he said? Wrong. I asked another question. Why? Because I wanted to draw the truth out of him. And he said, well, he failed in his responsibility to his dependents, to the people around him who were vulnerable, because a captain has knowledge and insight, and he has responsibility to use that for the safety of the people in his midst. Unfortunately, what that captain did in abandoning his ship by putting himself before others was something that occurred even more recently, approximately a year ago. There was a captain not of a cruise ship, but of a ferry in South Korea that had several hundred teenagers on a field trip. And that, hit, uh, that ship hit rough waters. There was a storm. It capsized. Several hundred lost their lives. But the world was outraged in this incident as it was in the previous incident. And again, it wasn't merely the accident. It wasn't merely the loss of life. But it was the fact that in that case as well, the captain abandoned ship. And our world, back then with the, with the cruise ship and, and presently or more recently with the ferry, looked at these incidents and said what those captains did was wrong because they put themselves before others. So then I said to this student, now there was another major passenger vehicle accident that also drew the world's attention and also involved the actions of a captain that caused people to look closely at what had gone on. But in this passenger vehicle accident, it wasn't a cruise ship, it was an airplane. Several years before the cruise ship accident, almost to the day, a U.S. Airways plane had taken off from LaGuardia Airport in New York. And as the plane was taking off, my country got in the way. In fact, I should apologize on behalf of my country, but our Canadian geese decided to take the exact same flight pattern as that U.S. Airways airplane. And so as the plane was going up and our Canadian geese were going up, Suddenly, the Canadian geese got sucked into the engines of the airplane, and both engines had immediate failure. And the captain of the airplane, Captain Chesley Sullenberger, realized he needed to make an emergency landing. But he also knew he did not have time to get to any of the nearby airports, and so he realized he had a choice to make. Crash his plane into the buildings of New York City, or do his best to land his plane as safely as possible on the Hudson River. I'm just going to skip ahead here. If I could just have AV, I believe my picture of that very plane should be coming up. <laughs> Is this? It's on. Note to self, don't let the laptop close. There we go. All right. This became known as the miracle on the Hudson, where indeed Captain Sullenberger was able to safely land his plane. And when that plane would have come to a stop on the water of the Hudson River, besides everyone probably, you know, calling out for joy that they were still alive, hopefully they would have remembered the emergency protocols that I as a frequent flyer typically tune out. You know, just before the plane takes off, they say, in the event of a water landing, and that's when I don't pay any attention because I think to myself, in the event of a water landing, I'm dead. And then this happened, and I thought, I need to pay attention. So hopefully everyone in the airplane had paid attention. In the event of a water landing, you do what? You, you grab your life jacket, which is either below your seat or it is your seat, and then what do you do? Proceed to 
Not just the exit, but the nearest exit. And they often say, don't forget to look behind you. It might be right there. So everyone at the back of the plane, see, I am starting to pay attention. So everyone at the back of the plane would have gone to the back. But what they didn't realize is that the tail of the plane was tucked down in the water. The first person who gets to the door whips the door open and welcomes in the Hudson River. And so now water is flooding into the cabin. And as everyone is getting away from the back of the cabin, escaping out the middle doors and the front doors, one person, Captain Chesley Sullenberger, is walking towards the back of the cabin. As everyone's getting off, He's staying on. And as water was filling the airplane, he walked the aisle twice to make sure no one was left on the plane. He was the last person to get off. I looked at the student I was speaking with and I said, what did our world say about him? What do you think the student said? A hero. Right, I said, why? And he said, well, because, because he put others before himself. I said, do you think he made the right choice? What do you think he said? Yes. So I said, it seems to me that you believe that the example we should follow in our world is not one in which we're selfish, like the captain of the cruise ship, or more recently, the captain of the ferry, but rather the example that we should follow is one in which we put others before ourselves instead of ourselves before others. That's what Captain Sullenberger did. And we know what he did was true and good and beautiful. So we should follow that with our own lives. Now, what sometimes happens if you use stories like that in dialoguing with people is they'll say, okay, well, fair enough, but there's a big difference here. Captain Sullenberger did a great thing because he had others in his midst that he needed to put before himself. But when a woman is pregnant, there is no other individual there. It's just her. So I agree with you, we should put others before ourself, but only if there's someone else there. And so what we often have to do in conversation is prove to the person we're dialoguing with that the preborn child is an other. That that preborn child is equal to the passengers on the airplane. And just as if we should put those people before ourselves, then that woman should put her preborn child before herself. It doesn't mean that she loses her life in the same way Captain Sullenberger didn't lose his. And he's alive today. But what it does mean is that we are more outward focused than inward focused. So what we often have to do is establish that the preborn child is an other like the people on the airplane. How do we do that? Well, the question I like to ask people to focus the conversation on that topic is to say, do you believe in human rights? What do you think they'll say if you ask that question? Yes. So then I'll say, what about this human's rights? And hopefully, we're now synced up. Yes, we are. Excellent. What about this human's rights? What do you think the person will say upon seeing this image of a one-celled embryo? That's not a human. So then I ask another question. Well, what are her parents? Is the pregnant woman human? Is her partner human? If yes, then wouldn't it follow that the embryo must be human? Because two human parents can't produce a cat, right? <laughs> it can't happen. So if we want to know what something is, we ask, what are her parents? And because the parents of the embryo are human, then the embryo must be human. And then the abortion supporter may say, well, even if the embryo's human, the embryo's not alive. So we ask another question. Is the embryo growing? Is the one cell splitting into two and then four and then eight and 16? And if by her growth, which we know is happening, or if she's growing, wouldn't it then follow that she's alive? And then at that point, the abortion supporter may say, well, it's just a fetus. Well, if they're to say that the preborn child is just a fetus, we ask another question. What kind of fetus? After all, what's that? A dolphin what? A dolphin fetus. So by asking questions, we show that other species have fetuses. If we want to know what something is, we don't ask what it, if, if the thing is a fetus. We ask, what are the thing's parents? 
Are the parents dolphins? Are the parents dogs? Or are the parents humans? Because what the parents are will determine what the offspring are. Fetus is an age category. When the fetus is born, I'll ask people I speak with, what do we refer to that fetus as? A baby. And when that baby turns two, what do we refer to the baby as? A toddler. And when that toddler turns 13, what do we refer to the toddler as? I'm hearing different answers. I once gave a talk and an elderly woman piped up, impossible, that's what we call her. <laughs> when impossible turns 21, what do we call impossible? Maybe other labels. <laughs> An adult. And so the very line of questioning I asked you is what I would ask someone in conversation in order to draw out of them that they and I share the idea or share the belief that in our species we have words to refer to age ranges that tell us how old something is. And the word fetus is like the word baby, toddler, teenager slash impossible, adult, that all these words tell us how old someone is but not what someone is. We determine what they are by asking what are their parents. And so because we know the parents are human, the offspring's human. Because we know the offspring is growing, we know the offspring is alive. And since we have a living human and we believe in human rights, it would follow that the human right to life that you and I have is a human right to life that living human has as well. At that point, the abortion supporter may say, well, even if it's a living human... Surely at fertilization, it's not a living human when you're dealing with something the size of a period at the end of a sentence. Well, if we believe that right now we're living humans with human rights, then it would follow the whole time that we've existed, we've been living humans with human rights. So at what point did our lives begin? There are three options. Option one would be before fertilization, when we have the sperm and the egg by themselves. Option two would be at fertilization, and option three would be sometime after fertilization. And we can very quickly rule out the first option by simply asking a question. Will the eggs in a woman's body, without any sperm in her body, will those eggs grow and mature into an adult human? No. Will the sperm in a man's body grow and mature into an adult human? No. And so we see that the sperm and the egg by themselves are merely human parts. When they come together at fertilization, it forms a whole human who admittedly is smaller and less developed and in a different environment and more dependent than a born human. But a born human is also smaller and less developed and maybe in a different environment and more dependent than a human who's 15 or 20 if that born human is merely an infant. The sperm and the egg by themselves differ from all of us in kind. Human parts versus whole human. But the embryo, the fetus, or even the infant and toddler differ from all of us by degree. We're the same kind, but there's certain degrees of things about us that are different when we compare one to the other. The degree of our size, the degree of our development, the environment that we may be in, or the degree of our dependency. That varies from one individual to the next according to how old we are. But what we are as human beings is determined at fertilization. And from that point forward, we just need time to grow and develop. When I was once speaking to a group of students in the seventh grade, I said to these students, giving them a very simplified pro-life presentation, I said to them, I want you to imagine that I'm an alien from another planet who's come to Earth for the first time, and as I, as I encounter you Earthlings, I hear you talking about people. Imagine I don't know what a person is. If you had to define a person for me, how would you do it? Now, the reason I ask these students this question is because what often happens in the abortion debate is abortion supporters will divorce the idea of human from person. And they'll say a human is what you are biologically, but a person is much, much more. If you can think, if you can reason, if you have conscious thoughts, if you're self-aware, if you're rational, you're a person. And they'll say because the one-celled embryo can't think or reason or is self-aware at that moment, the embryo's not a person. 
And so I asked these students how they would define person to someone who didn't know what a person was in order to draw out of them what a person actually is. And so a guy in the front row, tiny little kid, raised his hand right away when I asked what a person is, and he says, a person is someone with two arms and two legs. And I looked at him and I said, are you sure about that? And I began to tell the students about uh, Nick Vujicic. You should be able to see him photoed here. And I told these students about Nick Vujicic, a motivational speaker who I had the privilege of meeting several years ago. And as you can see from the image, Nick doesn't have arms or legs. When I told the students about him, I said to them, is he a person? What do you think they said? Yes. Well, then I said, the answer to what is a person cannot be having arms and legs because he doesn't have arms and legs and you're telling me he's a person. So what's a person? Then a guy at the back of the room raises his hand and he says, a person is someone with feelings, someone who can feel things. So I began to tell the class about Gabby Gingrass, a little American girl with a very rare condition where she can't feel pain. As a baby, when she was teething, Gabby chewed her tongue like it was bubble gum and bit her little fingers until they bled because she never felt pain to tell her to stop doing those things. I looked at the students and I asked them, is Gabby a person? What, did you think they, what do you think they said? Yes. Then I said, the definition of a person can't be feeling pain because she doesn't feel pain and she's a person. So what's a person? A girl at the front raises her hand and she goes, a person is someone who can think and talk. I said, well, my nephew Francis, when he was born, couldn't really think or talk. Was he a person then? What do you think they said? Yes. Well, then I said, if all the definitions you're giving me are being disproved with all the examples I'm giving you, then what is a person? And I noticed there was a girl near the back of the room frantically waving her arm trying to get my attention, the kind of keener who probably should have been in the front. But anyways, I finally obliged, and I said, yes, how would you define person? And she was quite exasperated that I had made her wait so long, and she goes, look, it's really easy to figure out if someone is of the species Homo sapiens, and if they are, then they are a person. Now indeed, this seventh grade girl was on to something. The one and only tie that binds each one of us is our human nature. And if our legal right to personhood, our right to life, is grounded in what we are, then everyone is protected. But if our personhood, our legal right to life, is grounded in whether we have arms and legs, feel pain, can think or talk, then we're not merely excluding the preborn child. We're also excluding born humans like Nick, like Gabby, like my newborn nephew. Whenever people bring up the idea of personhood, it's helpful to make reference to a body, an institution that as pro-lifers we often think of as being pro-abortion. And that institution is the United Nations. But if we actually read several documents of the United Nations, what becomes clear is that in their documentation, their views are profoundly anti-abortion. The United Nations, in its Universal Declaration of Human Rights, says all members of the human family have the right to life. So we need only prove that the preborn child is a member of the human family, and then it would follow that she has a right to life. What's interesting is that in Article 6 of this declaration, it says everyone has a right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. Everyone, who's everyone? All members of the human family. So all members of the human family have a right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. What that declaration acknowledges is that human is a term we can determine objectively, scientifically. But person is a legal term that has had a changing definition throughout history. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted on the heels of the Holocaust, where some humans, Jews, were deprived of personhood status based on an irrelevant feature, such as ethnicity or religion. And so the UN said, we need to reject that idea. Simply, if you're a member of the human family, you're a person. And so that view then applies to the preborn child as well. 
What's also interesting to note about the United Nations is they've adopted a document called the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And within this document, it talks about countries where the death penalty is permitted, and it says in such countries the death penalty may not be done on a pregnant woman. What's a good question to ask? Why not? What is the difference between a guilty woman who's not pregnant and a guilty woman who is pregnant? Within the body of the pregnant woman is an innocent party. And regardless of our opinions on the death penalty, both sides of that debate have a common view on how we treat the innocent. And both sides of the death penalty debate agree that no innocent person should ever get the death penalty. And so by having this standard that pregnant women may not get the death penalty, they are acknowledging that within her body is an innocent person who we should protect. As a result of doing that simple back and forth dialogue, we can establish in people's minds the idea that the preborn child is an other like those on the airplane. And since we believe we should put others before ourselves, we need to care for and protect preborn children. Now, the second quality I mentioned of inspiring people is not only that they put others before themselves, but that they have the power of perspective. One of my favorite books is authored by Viktor Frankl. It's called Man's Search for Meaning. In this book, written by a man who survived the Holocaust, Frankl writes, the last of the human freedoms that can never be taken from us is the freedom to choose how to respond to the situation that we're in. That's perspective. No matter what the circumstance, I choose my response. Viktor Frankl elaborates on this in his book when he talks about after the Holocaust, when he was practicing as a psychiatrist, a depressed man came to him who could not get over the death of his wife. For two years, he'd endured deep depression, misery, and suffering at the absence of his wife. And he came to Dr. Frankel hoping to get help. And Dr. Frankel looked at this man and he asked him a question. Sir, he said, what if you had died first and your wife were still alive? How would she have handled that? And he said, oh, doctor, she would have been miserable. The woman that I love so deeply would have suffered so profoundly. She would have been so sad living day in and day out in my absence. Well then, Dr. Frankel said to him, <laughs> it seems to me that by you suffering in this way, by you living your life in her absence, you are sparing the woman you love a suffering that she would have known had you died first. And his perspective changed, and he got up, and he calmly shook the doctor's hand, and he walked out of the office. Dr. Frankel once said, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds meaning in the meaning of a sacrifice. Perspective. How do I control my attitude in the situation that I'm in? We see the power of perspective in one of my favorite movies that I was re-watching over Christmas in Lord of the Rings. And in the first episode of the three films, there is episode, the first movie, there is this exchange between Frodo and the wise wizard Gandalf after they had gone through a particularly perilous journey and there had been a moment of calm and quiet. And Frodo opens his heart to Gandalf and he says, I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had ever happened. And Gandalf looks at him and says, So do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. That is perspective. We can lament and we can complain about the difficult situation we're in, or we can say, that's a normal reaction. 
but I have to decide what to do about the situation that I'm in. One area where I believe we need a profound perspective change is in the area of poor prenatal diagnosis, where all too often our culture's reaction is negative, but if we just change our perspective, we can make our reaction profoundly positive. What I want to do now is play for you a short video clip about a photographer by the name of Rick Guidotti, who very much teaches us the importance of changing our perspective when it comes to poor prenatal diagnosis. Rick Guidotti's life has been all about beauty and the power of images. He spent years as a fashion photographer in Milan, Paris, and with a studio in New York, always shooting what fashion editors decreed to be beauty. Then, 15 years ago, when he considered photographing a woman with a disability, he was shocked at images in medical textbooks he consulted. Where, he asked, is the humanity. It doesn't work like this. That doesn't help. This doesn't help. This is sad. I haven't looked at this book over. in 25 years. It's terrifying. Years. There's other ways to present this. I've spoken to so many genetic counselors that have a family in front of them, and they say, okay, this is what your daughter's going to have. Read this. And they cover up the photographs so of the family because it'll freak the family right out. There's got to be something else that we can do. There's got to be another way to present that information to that family. So this is Kiara. Now, Those Kiara medical pictures changed his life. Ever since then, he has devoted his talent to the disabled. People like Kiara. She has albinism, a congenital disorder that not only affects pigmentation, but vision. This is stunning. Oh, it's a great photograph. Yeah, I love the photograph. But they told her, no, don't be a dancer. You don't have enough vision to follow the choreography. You'll never dance in chorus. Find another dream. She said, no. She's New Zealand's Celtic dance champion. His pictures are nothing short of stunning and are being exhibited in public places around the world, aimed at changing how we see people who appear different. But he started with albinism. Who was your first person you photographed and you thought, oh, I see something oh, so yeah, different? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was Christine. Christine walked into the studio and she's beautiful. She has long, long, long white hair, pale skin. But she walks in like that. No eye contact, no one word answers. This kid was teased every single day in her life. And it was like holding up a mirror and saying, look at yourself, you're magnificent. And she saw it and she just exploded. That's who, that's her. I mean, she's so beautiful. And she changed right in front of the lens. She was nothing like the pictures of albinism he had found in medical textbooks. These are the images that I saw, but I also Classics. not only saw those images, I saw like freak circus sure. albino families. And, and I was like, oh, this is horrible. And then, and then, of course, all the movie references. Always his freaks. Usually the bad guy, usually the villain, the evil albino. He approached other women who had been born with albinism, people like Margaret Breed. I definitely hadn't seen myself like that before when he approached me and, you know, said, I want to photograph you, you're beautiful. Uh, definitely hadn't been in my vocabulary for thinking about myself. I started photographing these kids and hearing their stories and these adults. So I called Life Magazine and said, hey, I've got this great story. Six weeks later, it was a major spread in Life Magazine. Well, then someone said, it's not just about people with albinism. It's about celebrating all difference. Would you come and photograph our families at our chromosome 18 conference? It was in San Antonio. And I'm thinking, what the hell is a chromosome 18 anomaly? I had no idea. Chromosome 18 anomaly is a genetic defect that can produce a whole range of severe malformations. Were you shocked? It was like I got slapped in the head, punched in the stomach, it ended. I, I thought, what happens if we're having a baby? And we find out that this baby is born with a chromosome 18, and that's what you see. Can you make beauty out of a trisomy you know, 18? Look at their gorgeousness there. This is, that's gorgeous kid. That's Pauline. That's Rebecca. These kids are, are superb. Ellington, these are all from the chromosome 18. Remy, she's stunning. She's amazing. Rick is the subject of a film to be released later this year. Award-winning documentarian Joanna Rudnick followed him to a conference of families whose children have chromosome 18 anomalies. Rick took pictures of him the way I saw him. Not the way everybody else saw him, but the way I saw him. And it was the first time I had somebody tell me how beautiful he was. He didn't tell me he was small. He didn't tell me he had fat cheeks from his steroids. And they were these most beautiful pictures of this blue-eyed little baby. 
Have fine. you seen the positive exposure presentation yet? Yes, we have. So last year, Yes, right? last year we saw it. Ah, Where Dottie's hope lies in young medical students. He's a regular on campuses around the country. I really want to hear your opinion on that. And the idea is to put the humanity, make sure that that humanity is in medicine, to make sure that we see not a disease, a diagnosis, but a human being. I know we all know that there's a lot of science in medicine, but I can assure you there's a lot of art in medicine as well. That is so important that that's, you're not, it's not what you're treating, it's who you're treating. It's not... <laughs> It's not what you're treating, it's who you're treating, and that is the power of perspective. Another area where I believe we need to change our perspective is when the poor prenatal diagnosis is so serious that a couple is told their child will die at birth. And more often than not in those situations, couples are pressured to abort. And I was once talking at a university campus and a student raised his hand during Q&A and he said, my stepmom had to have an abortion because she was told her baby would die at birth. Are you telling me she's wrong? And my first response was to express sympathy. I said, I am sorry for your stepmom's suffering. And I don't pretend to know what that loss must have been like. And it saddens me that all too often in the medical community, doctors and nurses may encourage people like your stepmom to have an abortion. I would like to explain to you why I believe carrying to term is the right solution. But part of my ability to explain that involves asking a question. If you don't mind, could I dialogue with you for a bit? And he said, sure. What, what do you want to say? And I said, well, my question to start with would be to ask you to imagine something. I said, imagine you have a loved one on the opposite end of the country who calls you up today and says, I've just been diagnosed with stage four cancer. I've, I've been given four weeks left to live. I looked at the student and I said, would you wait until the sixth day of the third week to hop on the plane and fly to your loved one and say goodbye? Or would you get the first plane out and savor every moment of every day of the next four weeks with the person you love? What do you think he said? The second option I found common ground. I said, I agree. And what I think this says about you and me is that when we have a minimal amount of time left with someone we love, we maximize the minimal time we have. We don't cut short the already short time. I said, now take that and apply it to the situation you told me about. If a couple is 20 weeks through their pregnancy and get this diagnosis, they have 20 more weeks left. Before the diagnosis, they would have thought they had 50 years left with their child. But in one moment, they went from 50 years to 20 weeks. And I looked at the student, I said, based on your answer in my imaginary scenario, why would we cut short the already short time we have left? Wouldn't we want to maximize the minimal time and savor every moment of every day of the next 20 weeks with the child that we love? That is perspective. We need to not only bring perspective in the abortion debate when it comes to poor prenatal diagnosis, but even just the crisis of the moment. A girl in a crisis pregnancy may be thinking to herself, this slide will come up in a moment here, my mom's going to kill me. As I often like to ask teenagers when I'm speaking at high schools, will this girl's mom actually physically kill her when she finds out she's pregnant? And they always say, well, no. And then I say, but on the off chance the mom would kill the daughter, would it be wrong? What do you think they say? Yes. So then I say, based on the evidence I've gone through for the preborn child being a living human, wouldn't the act of abortion kill that living human? And if so, then let's change our perspective and look at this picture another way. And if it's wrong for this girl's mom to kill her child, the teenager, why is it okay for this teenager who's a mom to kill her child, the preborn? It's all about changing our perspective. Even as pro-lifers, 
We need to remember the importance of changing our perspective. There are times where we may feel compelled to speak in the classroom or maybe once we begin our careers, if we're teachers and students ask about abortion, if we're doctors or nurses and patients come to us, and there will be temptations in those moments to be silent because we're afraid. But what we have to do is change our perspective. See, the perspective we often start with in fear is, if I speak up, what will happen to me? But if we change our perspective, we could instead say, if I don't speak up, what will happen to them? Change our perspective. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., in the last speech he gave before he was killed, reflected on the story of the Good Samaritan. And in his reflection, he talked about that very idea of perspective of changing the question we ask ourselves. And he said, you know, we have all these theories for why in the story of the Good Samaritan, the priest and the Levite never stopped. He goes, but I'm going to tell you why I think the priest and the Levite didn't stop. I think they didn't stop because those men were afraid. Because the Jericho Road was a dangerous road. It was a winding, meandering road, very conducive to ambushing. And so it's possible the priest and the Levite looked at the man lying there and they wondered if the robbers were still around. It's possible that the priest and the Levite looked at the man lying there and wondered if he was merely faking it, trying to lure them in for quick and easy seizure. The first question the priest asked, Dr. King said, the first question the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then King said the Samaritan came by, and he reversed that question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? If we think for a moment about what caused the Samaritan to stop and help, it was because the scriptures tell us he was moved with compassion. He saw the suffering of his fellow human being. And it was upon seeing the suffering that his perspective changed. And he stopped his journey to help another. Recently, when in the Philippines, Pope Francis said that we need to learn how to weep. We need to learn how to weep. When we encounter the suffering of our fellow human beings, we need to learn how to suffer with, how to weep, and allow that weeping to stir in our hearts a compassion that causes us to respond to their need. In the same way, for us to get an important perspective change about how important it is we be willing to sacrifice for the sake of preborn children. I believe as the man on the road to Jericho, the Samaritan, encountered the victimization of the robbed victim and responded because of what he saw. So too, I believe, we can get that perspective change if we encounter the victimization of the preborn child and respond to what we see. In a moment, I'm going to play for you a video I hope you will use as a tool to bring the child's victimization from the darkness into the light so that people are moved with compassion. Because when we withhold evidence, lives are endangered. Let me give you an example. There's a man by the name of Michael Morton who was unjustly convicted of murdering his wife and was in prison for almost 25 years for a crime he did not commit. Michael Morton, an innocent man, was in prison because evidence was withheld. The bandana found near the murder scene with blood on it had not only his wife's blood, but the actual murderer's blood, and that evidence was withheld. His son, at the age of three, had been an eyewitness to the murder, was asked if his father had been the person that he saw, and said no, and the evidence was withheld. 
For 25 years, an innocent man suffered because evidence was withheld. And it wasn't just him who was victimized, he who was victimized. But the murderer, because he wasn't caught, committed another murder that wouldn't have happened had the evidence been brought forward. In the same way, we need to bring forward the evidence of the preborn child's victimization so that people respond to save these children so that no more lives are lost. Let's have a look. Was scheduled by his mother to be aborted. But she encountered images like you saw. And when she encountered those images, her heart was moved with compassion, just like the Good Samaritan upon seeing the robbed victim was moved with compassion. And she canceled her appointment and several months later gave birth to baby Adrian. We must, as Pope Francis said, let us learn, we must learn how to weep. And when we experience the suffering of another, we can change our perspective. Inspiring people not only change their perspective and put others before themselves, but the final point I want to wrap up with today is that inspiring people are willing to do the right thing even when it's hard. And if we're to think for a moment about the circumstances of an unplanned pregnancy, whether it's rape, poverty, whether the woman is finding there's health problems as I discussed, maybe she's too young, maybe she has no support, the pro-life person and the pro-abortion person can agree that these circumstances are hard. What I often ask people to consider is, what if the person in these circumstances wasn't pregnant, but parenting a born child? Would it be easy or hard to parent this child looking in her face, being reminded every day that her father is a rapist? Hard. Would it be easy or hard to parent this born child and be in abject poverty? Hard. Would it be easy or hard to parent this born child and be really young and have no support? hard. And yet, what would we say? We have to do the right thing even when it's hard, and we can't end this child's life. So too with the preborn child. To be pregnant from rape, pregnant and poor, pregnant and have no support would be hard. Are we willing to do the right thing even when it's hard? I once met a university student by the name of Nadej, who indeed chose the right thing even when it was hard. At the age of 16, she found out she was pregnant. 
Her boyfriend abandoned her. Her father abandoned her. Her five brothers abandoned her. And her mother had been dead since she was two years old. Nadezhda's circumstances were very hard. And yet when I met her, she was a mother of a toddler. She chose life. How did you do it, I asked. And to quote her directly, she said, well, I seeked help. And she talked about going to a pregnancy center, and although it wasn't easy, she was given support and assistance and people who journeyed with her, and they couldn't make it easy, but they made it easier. And the Dej said, if everyone did what was right instead of what they wanted to do, I think the world would be a better place. That's what inspiring people teach us to do, to do the right thing even when it's hard, to have perspective, and to put others before ourselves. When my conversation wrapped up with that teenager, and I had drawn all those principles out of him, in his case, about the boxer he was inspired by, he was transformed. He was calm when before he'd been angry. He wasn't cutting me off when he had been before. He was provoked to profound thought and reflection, and he smiled at me and he shook my hand. Did he leave away in that moment saying, well, I'm totally against abortion? No, because I wasn't going to force that out of him. I wasn't going to say, oh, check, I can put this on my badge. I was just a link in a chain, a bond of connection between persons who was drawing truth out of someone and allowing the truth to settle in the time frame he needed. I'd like to close with the words of Bishop Untener of Michigan, who I believe gives great advice to us when we find ourselves in conversation with others, but we don't always see the results. And we know we're part of a, a bigger connection, a bigger network of people who are working with us. It was decades after Nicholas Winton had saved 669 children that he met them as adults. We may one day meet preborn children we've saved from abortion, and we may not. But either way, let us heed the words of Bishop Untener, who said, This is what we are about. We plant seeds that one day will grow, we water seeds already planted knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces effects beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything, he said, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that because it allows us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for God's grace to enter and do the rest. We may not see the end results, he says, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders. We are ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets, of a future not our own. God bless you.